Welcome to Back to the Bible. When Peter wrote his first letter, Christian persecution was on the rise. So how you behaved, even within your own home, spoke volumes to the culture at that time. Brian Clark will break that down in his message from 1 Peter. Then he'll join Kara Whitney and Arnie Cole in studio to talk about what that means for your life today. Now here's Brian with today's message. We've reminded ourselves on many occasions that when everyone is selfish and self-centered and demanding their rights, there is virtually no chance for flourishing. That story will always end badly. We're also reminded that we as the people of God are called to something different and called to something more. We have been called to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter is reminding us that we don't just do that with words. We do that with behavior. How do we silence the critics? It's not through debate. It's not through arguing. But it's through our behavior that wins them to Christ. As a citizen, in relationships that are unfair, and this morning we want to talk about what does this look like at home. So if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We've been working our way through 1 Peter. We find ourselves in chapter 3, verse 1. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Well, isn't that a little delicate? (laughs) Well, let's talk about that and kind of make sure we get off on the right foot here. It's really important to understand the historical context, what was going on, and why Peter is saying what he's saying. So first of all, it's worth noting it starts in the same way. What that's referring to is we have been told that, yes, we are free in Christ, but we're not free to sin, we're not free to rebel, we're free to be a bond slave to Christ, which means we're free to surrender and submit in order to accomplish the mission or the calling which we have been given. So we've all been called to be submissive to government, to be surrendered and submissive in relationships that are even unfair. So for anyone to walk out the door, specifically a woman or a wife, and say somehow you are being called to something different from everyone else, that would certainly not be true. We're all called to submit. We're all called to surrender. What God is asking of a wife is no different than what he's asking of a husband or anyone else. But it's helpful to understand the context into which these words are given. One of the things that's worth noting is Peter is speaking directly to the women. Now, that may not uh, impress us, but to understand in a first century culture that was almost unheard of. Philosophers and teachers did not teach women. So already, Peter is breaking through some of the cultural codes, and he is actually speaking directly to the women, which is an act of honoring them. The text tells us that some of these husbands are disobedient to the word, meaning they are unbelievers. So imagine the scenario. There is a couple where the wife comes to faith in Jesus. In a first century Roman marriage, there was what they referred to as the household order. One of the ways that Rome controlled the empire was they had certain expectations in a community and certain expectations in a marriage. It was the man's responsibility to control his home, was the wife's responsibility to be in submission to that, even to the degree that women were considered to be his 
a wife was considered to be the husband's property. And so she was not really to have friendships or relationships outside of his relationships. And it was expected that a wife automatically uh, adopt the religious beliefs of the husband. So everything's going along fine, and then she comes to Christ. Now immediately there is a level of disorder, according to the Romans. She is no longer embracing the belief system of her husband. If she has community with other believers, she's building relationships outside of his network, which again is out of order in terms of the expectations in a Roman marriage. Now, if that becomes known, the husband will be criticized. The husband will be publicly shamed. If the husband is in business, it would probably cost him business. It would disqualify him from certain honors and positions in the community. By and large, they would make his life miserable until he dealt with his home, which was considered to be out of order. So try to imagine just how delicate this has now become. Imagine what it would be like for a Muslim couple living in Iran, and the wife comes to faith in Jesus. Try to imagine how delicate that would be for her, for her husband, for her children. If she does not conduct herself wisely, the potential ramifications could be severe, even dangerous. So this is the kind of situation in which these wives find themselves. We've already dealt with the idea that the Christians were being slandered. A big part of the slander is that their Christianity made them rebellious. Rebellious against the government, rebellious against the Caesar, rebellious against the religious establishment, rebellious against the home order. So we've been told already that the way to silence the critics, those that slander, is by choosing to do good or to do right. And it takes a careful amount of thought and skill and strategy in a very delicate situation, or this could all end badly. That's kind of the idea behind this text. This text is not intended to teach the biblical overview of marriage. You have to find that other places. This is dealing with a very specific situation. They are foreigners, they are aliens and strangers living in a foreign land with no real rights. They are undergoing a degree of persecution as Christians. That persecution is about to ramp up dramatically. And in the midst of all of this, this is a very delicate situation. So the idea is not just how does the wife survive, but how does she win her husband to Christ? So the text says, it's not words, it's behavior, that they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. You're listening to Back to the Bible. If you'd like to listen again, visit backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org. Here again is Brian Clark with today's message. Verse 2, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. The word chaste is a word that literally means without contamination, often referred to as moral purity, but it's really more than that. It's kind of free from any contaminated behaviors, whether that's manipulation, whether that's kind of a passive aggressive behavior, what, uh, if there's kind of a hidden agenda. It's really free from all of that. It's just genuinely seeking to be a good wife. Now stop and think about how uh, delicate these dynamics are. This couple's going along, and from the husband's perspective, everything seems fine. Then she comes to Christ. Now, 
it's become very delicate. He's being criticized. He's potentially being shamed. Now, she seems genuinely dissatisfied with him as a husband. She's now trying to change him as a husband. And he views Jesus as not someone who's attractive, but he views Jesus as a competitor for his wife's affections. Everything was fine until Jesus got in the picture. That doesn't make Jesus attractive. As a matter of fact, it's just the opposite. He develops deeper and deeper resentment towards this one who is, in his opinion, made a mess of his marriage. That's why it's such a critically important part of the strategy that she is perceived as becoming a better wife. That now this is even a better wife, which makes her more attractive, which causes him to be more interested in this Jesus who seems to have changed her in such a wonderful way. So the idea of chaste is just her behavior is pure and it's genuine as a wife to her husband. Respectful is the same word we saw in regard to slaves and masters. Part of it carries this idea of respect how delicate this is. This is not only difficult, this is potentially dangerous. In a first century Roman marriage, she was viewed as property, and he pretty ha much had the liberty to do what was ever necessary to get her under control. So both to her and her fellow Christians, respect the potential for disaster if this is not handled carefully. That's the idea there. Verse 3, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious or valued in the sight of God. In the first century, just like the 21st century, it wasn't uncommon that women would use their externals to try to control their man. It was a very uh, common part of the culture. So perhaps part of the temptation for these women to somehow influence their man, even to Christ, was through an overemphasis on the external. But what Peter is saying is ultimately what's been radically changed in you is not on the outside, but it's what's on the inside. And it's what's on the inside that will provide what is necessary to win his heart to Jesus. So it's not saying that the outside is unimportant. It's just saying that the emphasis, the focus should be on the internal character, what's really been radically changed by the power of Jesus. It's interesting that it refers to that as the imperishable quality. The literal means the unfading quality. Some of the most insecure women I know are women that are physically very beautiful because there's a sense in which they know this will fade away. If they've gotten their value on the basis of external beauty, there is a reality year by year, it's going away. And then what will I have left to give me value? There is this wonderful truth that what matters most is what's on the inside. And it's not a fading glory. It's something that just becomes stronger and more attractive as the years go by. And that's, in essence, what Peter has said. He describes it as gentle and quiet spirit. It's really important that you don't misunderstand those terms. The terms do not mean mousy, and mild. Some of you ladies simply weren't made that way. Good for you. God makes women with strong leadership potential, tremendous talents and gifts. There's nowhere in the Bible where you're ever asked as a woman to be less than the person God created you to be. It's not what the terms mean. As a matter of fact, these terms were used to describe Jesus. The idea of gentle 
is the Greek word that's sometimes translated meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's the same word. It's a term that means strength that is brought under control. It was a term that was used to describe a horse that had been broken to the bit. 1,200 pounds of raw power that is now useful in the hands of an owner because the horse's power has been brought under control. The best way to think about it is to think about who you are as the person God's made you to be. And what would it look like for those talents and those strengths and those qualities to be brought under control so that you partner with your husband in a way that is productive, in a way that will influence him toward Christ? Quiet has nothing to do with volume. It has nothing to do with whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. It isn't saying if God made you to be a talker, you need to not talk so much. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It has to do with someone who is a peacemaker. Someone who rather than creating conflict at home, creates peace at home. Creates an environment where there is flourishing. It's good to remind ourselves, both as husbands and wives, that anger, crabbiness, unpredictability are all forms of manipulation. Nobody wants to come home to that. If there is enough character that my strengths, my talents, my abilities, I can bring them under control, that's gentleness, in such a way that there is peace at home. There is harmony. This is a wonderful place to be. That's the idea that makes Jesus very attractive. It's the most likely scenario where an unbelieving husband is going to say, you know, whoever this Jesus is, he's actually made you a wonderful wife. And I'd like to know more about him. That's, that's the strategic part of this. Verse 5. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children if you do what is right, without being frightened by any fear. First of all, the idea, Lord, some, tr some uh, translations use the word master is super misleading in our vocabulary. It's not that the wives are supposed to say to their husbands, yes, master. That probably wouldn't be productive. The term actually is a term that just means a term of respect. In our language, it'd be like Mr. and Mrs. Kind of in generations gone by, it wasn't unusual that one partner or the other would refer to the other partner in social settings as Mr and misses. We don't really do that a lot these days. In terms of master, like master over a slave, it's a completely different Greek word. It's not this term. So don't read into it more than what is there. But it's also saying that this idea of submission within marriage is not unique to the Roman Empire. It's always been a part of the plan. You can't take two people and bring them together in a partnership without both of them being willing to surrender and to submit. That's the only way a true partnership can work. It's always been part of the design. Now Brian Clark joins us in the studio with author Kara Whitney and Back to the Bible CEO, Arnie Cole. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate your insight to this passage because there's always a lot of confusion about it. So before we go any further, submission, what does that mean in this particular context? Yeah, so great question, and there is a lot of confusion. And I think a lot of confusion between traditional roles and biblical roles for marriage. They're not necessarily the same. But the reality that Peter's dealing with is we all submit. He's talked about submitting to the government. He's talked about slaves submitting to masters. Now he's talking about life at home. But Every day we submit at work, we submit at home, to the government, we submit at school. So it's not 
right for women to think somehow wives are being asked to do something so radically different than everybody else. It's just this particular context is dealing with the specific issues and it deals with submission of wives to husbands and part of it because the situation is so delicate and it's so dangerous if she doesn't respond correctly it's possible a lot of people might die right i appreciated the picture of a gentle and quiet spirit that you gave us but there's actually a lot of strength there yeah there's a lot of strength those are terms used to describe jesus So the idea of gentle is often used to describe a horse that's broken to a bit. So the horse is still powerful, 1,200 pounds of raw muscle, but now the horse is useful, and a horse can even be gentle. I like to say so strong that you become gentle. You know, bullies may be physically strong, but they're not really strong. They're weak. They're weak in character. That's why they act the way they do. But somebody that's so strong can be gentle. The idea of quiet is is like a peacemaker. It's not being an introvert or extrovert or loud or soft. As a matter of fact, one of the real helpful ways to think of biblical roles is if at any point you feel like a biblical role is forcing you to be somebody different than who God made you to be, there's some misunderstanding. So it's a helpful way to process through it. So peacemaker, and you put the two together, it's to create flourishing shalom at home, which is a beautiful picture of the love story between Christ and his church. So Brian, Peter talks to us about Sarah here, and he encourages wives not to be afraid. I find it very interesting that Abraham drug her through the ringer, took her all these places, all of these crazy, scary things. How does that make sense? Well, I think it's a faith issue. So, you know, I'm a big fan of Sarah. In uh, Genesis 12 is what you're referring to, is the famine hits the land and they go back into Egypt. And Abraham says, this is my sister. And, you know, in that stuff. Yeah. And in that ancient culture, there's little she could do. But everything was at risk. I can't imagine how terrified she must have been. But she listened, she obeyed, and God steps in and works it out. And she becomes a good example of a submissive wife to a husband that was disobedient to the word. That's the conversation in Peter. So she's a woman of faith. You're listening to Back to the Bible. Thanks for joining us today. If you'd like to listen again, visit backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org.